thank you. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to see how much time I have here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, in fact, it's an honor. I, um, um, I'm just uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not an economist. I'm not a political scientist. I'm just a country copyright lawyer. I used to be a musician. Uh, I was I was invited to the. Uh, uh, I have a. I guess a kind of affinity to these libertarian events. I was invited a few years ago uh, by John Carpe to speak to the, the CCF down in Toronto. I think it was 2009. And uh, I'm fairly naive about these things, or I was. And I thought, oh, this is going to be some kind of event honoring the legacy of J.S. Woodsworth and Tommy Douglas. <laughs> well, it didn't quite turn out that way. <laughs> I got to be on the same program as Justice LaBelle from the Supreme Court, so that was all right. And, uh, and then I, I get a call from Matt Bufton, and, you know, several, a couple, few months ago, whatever. But I like to uh, address the, uh, the Institute of Liberal Studies, and I thought, oh, I always admired Pierre Trudeau and John Kay too. And all these people, and that'll be fun too. So, so that was very interesting to hear Stop all Day's remarks about the terminology. Uh, but anyway, uh, here I am, and I, 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 I have no partisan allegiance, particularly my. My liberal friends think I'm conservative, and my conservative friends think I'm a liberal, and I'm not sure that I even have any NDP friends, so there you go. <laughs> so, what I want to talk about today, and I am a practicing IP lawyer, uh, mostly copyright, and I dabble with uh, patents a little bit and, uh, and do some trademarks as well. So, sh should IP rights get charter protection as property? And my answer is, be careful what you wish for, and I think probably the more I think about it, the answer would be no. So let's start out with this uh, great, well-known philosopher, jurisprudence expert, and economist, and political scientist, but in Margaret Atwood, who told the Parliamentary Committee back in 1996, uh, a copyright revision and effort, that uh, and they said the question was photocopy in those days, mostly, uh, in the universities and schools. And she didn't like the idea of people copying parts of her work and studying them in the classroom and her not getting paid for it, even if it led to more book sales. So she said, exceptions to copyright and expropriation of our property against our will. If copyrights were cars, this would be car theft. Uh, she got criticized for that. Uh, somebody even more successful than her, J.K. Rowling, used a similar kind of metaphor when somebody tried to publish a, 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 a fan site and, and a little book with all kinds of trivia about Harry Potter and, and uh, all sorts of useful information. It was in no way a knockoff or a ripoff. But she and her publisher wanted to stop it. And she said, my name and my works have been, been hijacked. See all this property talk starting to emerge? And in, in 2005, you may remember, there was an incident where, where somehow, by accident apparently, uh, a few dozen or a few hundred of, of her books got sold a day or two before the official launch time of 12.01 midnight on whatever the day was. Well, her publisher went nuts and went to court and got this extraordinary injunction that he could not believe was ever issued in Canada or any other country in the world with the rule of law that, that, that actually enjoined people from reading the book if they happened to have it uh, or discussing it happened to read it, uh, and, and ordered them to bring it back to the bookstore for it to be impounded until one minute past midnight. Unbelievable. Anyway, um, Lucy Maud Montgomery tried from the grave to extend the term of copyright back in 2003. Her estate tried to pro sneak what I called at the time a mouse in the house, modeled after the American Walt Disney Mickey Mouse legislation, which extended the term of copyright, they tried to sneak a copyright term extension into Canada that would have prevented us from copying any of the works of Prime Ministers Bennett or Borden or Laurier or Stephen Leacock and others for, for, for quite a long time into the future, up until 2034 this would have had effect. Uh, fortunately, Jack Brandstein and I stopped this from happening. One of my proud accomplishments. Jack still owes me a beer for this. That was the sum of what I got paid. But I haven't been paid yet. Um, but uh, if you see him, remind him. Um, and this kind of suppression, use of copyright to suppress ideas, is still continuing. We just recently celebrated the big anniversary of Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. Well, his estate says, we have a copyright registration. And don't even think about talking about or quoting his dream. Okay. Probably wouldn't have sold as well. 
Anyway, so I got some facts of life from Margaret Atwood. I used to know her at Massey Colony. Um, many of you will be familiar with the term rivalrous. If I steal her BMW, or whatever it is she drives, then I have a BMW now, and she no longer has a BMW. And as, some, as we said earlier, that's, that's no good. I mean, nobody supports that kind of, of, uh, of Hobbesian world of just stealing things from each other, or violence, or whatever. But, you know, cars and copyright don't conflate. They're not the same thing at all. It's the really a silly metaphor that she came up with. And copyright and free speech can coexist. So Martin Luther King's estate can let people actually read their father's dream, and why not? Uh, maybe Tommy's going to talk about that later. I would uh, suggest that, that if you want to look to somebody who actually knows something about something, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a pretty bright guy. Uh, he was also very much in favor of ownership, believed in ownership of property, even slaves, but we don't want to talk about that too much. But uh, he's a big landowner and brilliant guy, if there ever was. And uh, he has a, there's a very famous quote, which is in all the literature, that uh, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine, taper means candle, um, receives light without darkening. That's a beautiful quote. It practically brings tears to my eyes. You know, he pass candles around the room. All of a sudden, the room is light. Whoever lit their candle for mine has not stolen anything from me, and I haven't lost anything. But the room is now a bright place. So the, the, some of these ideas have been looked at a lot, not just recently by libertarians, but, but before, as it was pointed out by Jan, you know, going back to Locke and, and perhaps even Plato and earlier. So then, you know, whether you call it natural law theory, utilitarian, Chicago schools have been very interested in this. Copy left, the libertarians, the property rights, and, and Terrence Thomas and the U.S. Supreme Court starting to get interested in this kind of thing. A pirate party, all kinds of people are on to this, these issues right now. Hopefully some good will come of it. And some important NGOs and think tanks are on to it as well. Um, I kind of got uh, interested in this a few years ago when Tom Flanagan was, I don't know if he's in this room, but he's, I guess he's in the other session. Uh, he, uh, he, he and, uh, and Gemma Collins, who was, uh, was a student at the time, she's now a speechwriter here in town, wrote an article, uh, an op-ed together, uh, uh, against the concept of imposing levies on blank audio recording media, which is a subject I've been interested in uh, professionally on behalf of clients and had some, some considerable successes in pushing back on. And by the way, I can, I always forget to say, but say for the record, what I'm saying today has nothing to do with my clients or my firm, it's just me. Um, so, what is property? I won't go over it a lot because, because we just had a brilliant uh, introduction to it and we all know something about it. And the most I can conclude is it's kind of like pornography. We know it when we see it. And it's getting more and more complicated to draw the line. Um, it being applied for everything from Aboriginal title to environment to rent control to, you know, civil servants in town here say, you know, I have basically, you know, I'm entitled, you know, to my two years of sick leave that I never took, as if it's a property right, or, or that departed cabinet cabinet minister want to get repaid for his his, his bubble gum. I'm entitled to my entitlements. Property has come to mean all kinds of things, some silly and some extremely important. Uh, we heard this morning from Dwight, brilliant explanation about uh, the relationship to the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments in the United States. Um, but what I keep urging, and I will urge throughout the rest of my time. Be careful what you wish for. There's a big, what I call, ratchet problem in intellectual property. And the United States is experiencing a big wave. If you extend the copyright term by 20 years, you ratchet it up, you can't get it back down. So as one of these days people are going to realize that that was a really dumb thing to give Bill Gates copyright in DOS code until 70 years after he dies, which could you know, well be the year 2100 or so, um, or more. That could tie up technology and innovation for a long time, and it is, and it's starting to happen. And it's starting to, and you can't undo it. Because that the very Fifth Amendment that we just looked at says you can't take away property that the government has given. So what are the hall, what, I mean, what are some of the hallmarks of property? We heard already about exclusion and taking and, uh, and the, the, the American notion of expropriation, which is that the government can control and regulate, it just can't totally kick you out of something. 
um, alien mobility, securitization. I edited a book and did a study for the Law Reform Commission on using intellectual property as security to borrow money to, uh, to buy houses. Right? And somebody mentioned earlier, it was, it was a stock day, somebody else, that you know, people can they own their house, they can borrow money and start a business. Well, in principle, you can do that with intellectual property too, although it's not so easy because people don't understand it, but they're starting to. So, as it happened just yesterday, uh, uh, the Ontario Superior Court ruled in the famous Ikea monkey case, and I urge you to read the ruling, it's on my blog. It's a very thoughtful, very serious ruling, despite the fact that everybody laughs about this case, uh, that has a lot to do with property and a lot to do with libertarian issues and the role of the state and should the state be able to come into this crazy woman's house and take her, her monkey away, which she says she has property in, uh, even though she wants to get his teeth pulled out because he doesn't bring, he's not very happy living in a, in a bungalow in Scarborough. Um, I mean, it, it involves a number of issues from animal rights to property ownership to the role of the state. Is the state, is it any business of the state if she wants to own a monkey and the monkey bites her husband? Is that really, you know, a societal problem? A very, very thoughtful decision you should read. It has nothing to do directly with intellectual property, but, uh, but it has a lot to do with property in the role of the state. Um, what is intellectual property? Well, I said it's like pornography. You know it when you see it. Some of it's fairly obvious. The obvious intellectual property comes from statutes. Um, patent statutes, the Patents Act, there's a Trademarks Act, there's a Copyright Act, uh, there's an Industrial Designs Act. Those are the main ones. There's integrated circuit topography legislation, which, which has to do with the you know, circuits inside our cell phone, whatever. It's, it's, it's more or less a dead letter law. Um, uh, there's still on the books something called the Timber Marking Act, which was very important in Ottawa, you know, back in the 19th century, or the, yeah, the 19th century, uh, when people used to float logs down the river, they would put some kind of a brand on it, like you put on cattle or a horse, and this is my log. Don't anybody take my log. So, uh, everybody floated their logs down the river in the spring and you sorted it out and you found your brand. Don't use it much anymore, obviously, because the logs are all on trucks on the Queensway now. Um, hopefully they don't fall off in your community. They do occasionally. Um, so uh, there's, also com there's also common law intellectual property to some extent in confidential information and trade secrets, the most famous example of a trade secret being the recipe for Coca-Cola. Not patented, because when you patent something, you have to disclose it, you have to write it down, and anybody can look it up in the patent office. And you're supposed to give enough information so that somebody can duplicate it. But Coca-Cola has managed to keep this, this secret uh, up until now, so they don't disclose it. There's also some really vague stuff, vague stuff at the margin, but it'll become important. There's some legislation in Quebec and federal legislation called the Status of the Artist legislation, which has to do with performing artists and, and people like that, and, and maybe has to do with visual artists. The Supreme Court will tell us how that uh, intersects or conflicts or doesn't conflict or whatever with the Copyright Act, maybe next year or so. The Supreme Court last year in December ruled on a case where the CRTC tried to impose uh, cost, a levy, a tax, whatever you want to call it, on, on the retransmission of local signals, which the Copyright Act says you can't do. But the CRTC said, well, never mind the Copyright Act, never mind the Copyright Act, we're smarter than them. We'll pass a regulation saying we'll do it, because, you know, because the, 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 the local TV stations, by CTV and whatever, are, are screaming poverty and they want money, so you know, uh, let's, let's give them a subsidy, uh, courtesy of the taxpayer. Uh, and cable subscribers. Well, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. Uh, the subject of copyright is covered in the Copyright Act, and, and, and any new copyright has to be conferred by legislation, not by regulation, and not by, it, it could be in the CRTC Act, but it has to be in the Act and not the regulations. That's a distinction that only lawyers can love, but a very important one. Um, you may or may not hear elsewhere at this conference about traditional knowledge, which is a very important to uh, the Aboriginal community, uh, whether you're talking about total pole, totem poles or how to make a birch bark canoe or, uh, or uh, Inuit sculpture. Um, some of these things go back thousands of years. And to talk about property in these things is, is completely antithetical and oxymoronic to, you know, kind of the lawyers that work on Bay Street or 
or uh, in Ottawa that normally do intellectual property, because the whole normal concept of intellectual property is it's a bargain with the state, and after a certain length of time, it expires. You get your monopoly for, for 20 years for a patent, or life plus 50 for a copyright, but then it's over. So James Joyce stuff has now gone to the public domain in Canada. Um, and everything uh, in a, a traditional copyright law and patent law goes into the public domain eventually. Trademarks can last forever if you keep using them. Uh, but there's a inherent conflict there, but it's one that's going to become very important. Kind of like with Aboriginal title of land, it doesn't work the same way up. At least it had, nobody's been able to figure out yet how to integrate the normal concepts of land that most of us deal with, with the concept with, with what is needed by Aboriginal people and what they are entitled to. And they were here before us, as we all need to remember. Um, there is no such thing as common law copyright. If there ever was, it was abolished by the House of Lords in 1854. There's no such thing. That it's very clear in Section 89 of the Copyright Act that there's no such thing as common law copyright. If it's not in the Copyright Act, you don't get it. Um, what is the purpose of copyright law? Well, the, the two best articulations you can find are not from Canada, but they're pretty much applicable here. The American Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, talks about patent and copyright law. To promote the progress, and this is 1789, or whatever it was, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times. That doesn't mean forever, it means, used to mean 14 years, got up to life plus 50, and then recently to life plus 70, but limited times. For authors and inventors, 20 years for inventors, the exclusive right to property talk to the respective writings and discoveries. Um, the UK Statute of Anne, which is the grand daddy or grand mommy of all modern copyright legislation from 1709, they used to have long titles then. And it was an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times therein mentioned doesn't talk about helping out publishers or record companies or movie companies. It talks about helping out authors and users of books. We've lost sight of that. So the, the utilitarian, libertarian dilemma is there's a kind of skepticism about ID. Uh, Jan quite inevitably mentioned this fellow Kinsella who's, who's, who's getting a lot of attention. I don't think he's quite up there in the, the pantheon with Nozick and Rawls and some of the Posner and some of these people, but he's, he, he has to, it's a force to be dealt with. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, Kinsella and many others quote the famous uh, economist Fritz Mackle, who basically said, if we did not have a patent system, be irresponsible on the basis of our present knowledge of its economic consequences to recommend instituting one. That was in 1958, which is a very fertile time in the economy, as some of us remember or have read about. Um, so IP is full of negative externalities, the Kinsella thinks that they're overwhelming, but there are also some positive ones too. It encourages dissemination, encourages access to knowledge when it works well and efficiently. It enables you know, us to have lots of CDs and CDs to be produced and DVDs and movies and books and whatever at a reasonable cost in the world's a better place. But it's getting out of sync. Uh, the, some of the tension, I don't know, I guess Karen Selleck is, I, is any, is she at this uh, convention? I seen her. Yeah, uh, I mean, she's well known in these circles. <laughs> she, I ran across this kind of uh, ambiguous copyright notice that she had on one of her pieces recently. She got, uh, well, 10 years ago, well, years ago, she was mm -hmm. not comfortable with the idea of IP, but she was happy to claim copyright. Um, it was mentioned earlier that, that, that Robert Nozick and others, uh, uh, everybody seems to be focusing on this book, um, uh, are, are onto this issue and they in turn trace back to Locke. Well, I won't go into that because I'm not a professional philosopher like, like John. So um, you, you can find these works quite easily. Um, but what are the, you know, libertarians concerned with freedom. So what are the freedoms that, that, uh, that uh, the copyright can give and, 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 and also take away, because that's important too. Um, there's some fallacies. I mean, uh, on both sides of the fence, you know, copyright gives 
gives people the freedom to create, to earn rewards, to get very rich. You know, Lady Gaga and Madonna, they make hundreds of millions of dollars a year from concerts and there's records even, and there's record sales even allowing for all the stuff that gets stolen now on the internet. Um, the copyright law gives you normal rights so people can't distort your work and if they take it they have to attribute it to you and, and uh, you have freedom to organize collectives, I'll come back to that. Um, and you have the freedom within limits to exclude, uh, and I'll come back to that. But uh, there's also a loss of freedom because uh, of, of all of the things on the left-hand side there have cost to them, either in terms of money or in terms of denial of access. So the main loss, and we're feeling it in Canadian universities, uh, especially compared to other universities around the world and school systems, is we're losing the freedom to, to stand on the shoulder of giants. And we all know who said that. And that's how the world, the world learns, uh, is by improving upon what came before. And nobody, nobody invents or composes or paints from a vacuum. They're all improving on what came before. There's a famous quote which is attributed sometimes to Picasso and sometimes to Stravinsky. I don't know whoever first came up with it because it's attributed to just about anybody you can think of. But it goes on something like this. Good artists borrow and great artists steal. And uh, yeah, that's right. If you study the history of music or art or whatever, there's an enormous amount of what many of you would call theft going on. But it's obviously theft with an improvement. I mean, you know, Raphael copied from Michelangelo, copied from, uh, for, for, from Leonardo. Uh, nothing wrong with that. They're all great in their own way and they all contributed something. And some of it's very practical. The obsession with intellectual property now means that people are being stomped at the border and having their laptops and their iPhones and whatever inspected to see if they have too many songs on them that, that maybe weren't paid for. Do we really want a world where that's going to happen? Uh, and there are some fallacies. You know, the, as Larry Lessig puts it, just because intellectual property is good doesn't mean that more of it's better. In fact, it can get worse. You know, the United States has six copyright collectives, six or seven copyright collectives. Is Canada better off because we have 36 of them? No. And our Supreme Court is starting to recognize that. You know, if control is good, is absolute control even better? No. Um, is copyright always an incentive to create? Well, there are documented studies of how the success of copyright basically turned Verdi into a rich old guy who didn't write anymore, and the same with Sibelius, and uh, you know, the Beatles, Michael Jackson, you know, there are all kinds of examples of very creative artists who dried up after they got extremely rich, and even if they didn't get shot, they would have just ceased at a certain standpoint. Um, I mean, but on the other side of the fence, there's a certain notion, and I've heard it because in my professional music days, whatever, that, that, that some people think it's a very good idea to keep artists lean and mean and basically starving because it forces them to work harder and work longer. We abolished slavery a long time ago. <laughs> um, so we, kept, we, kept, we keep coming back to this, what, what, what I and others call property talk. It's the, it's the illogical use of property words to something that doesn't really behave but like property, ownership, exclusion, theft, violation, crime, expropriation, homesteading, as mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, you, you obviously can exclude people from your land if you go to enough trouble. You can build eight foot thick walls and moats and have machine guns and security cameras and make it impossible for somebody to get into your castle. Um, you're physically impossible. Um, you can, uh, you know, really into homesteading, you can do stuff like this and keep people away. But you can't stop people from taking your ideas, and it's not really a very good idea if they do take your ideas. I mean, I don't think Jan will mind if we go out of here having learned something from him and, and impart his wisdom to others. I hope he doesn't mind. I hope he doesn't come after us with a machine gun. But you know what? That's what they're basically doing in the United States. This, this cute little girl up in the uptown, I was 12 years old. She got sued by the record industry for illegal downloading. The, uh, the older woman on the right is a single Aboriginal mother of two. She got sued for judgment against her for almost $2 million for downloading some of 24 songs. That got reduced, but it's still, I can't remember 
what, something like $667,000 that she has to pay. The, the kid in the middle with the old Professor Charlie Nesson, uh, has, um, there's a long story here, um, he's got a judgment against him, um, just graduated from Boston College, he's got a judgment against him for $675,000 for downloading a dozen songs or two dozen songs or something like that. And if the record industry is stupid enough to collect it from him, he's going to be indebted for the rest of his life. Does that serve any good? I mean, that Vlad the Impaler used to put people's head on a spike, but uh, you know those days hopefully are over. But not really, because you know the U.S. Customs Service wants to stop people at the border for intellectual property, you know, because they see it on a par with narcotics and child pornography and and uh, other contraband and terrorism. Why not take away somebody's laptop and check it? Um, uh, copyright and trademark are right up there with them. And this comes at the behest of the lobbying of the entertainment industry. It's not just government officials being officials, they're lobbying to do this. So I have to ask, we all have to ask, and this is not a misprint, is intellectual property property? And the answer is maybe, sometimes, for some purposes but not automatically. Just because property is good doesn't mean that stronger property is better in the case of ID. Uh, and uh, you don't have to believe me. You can believe the Supreme Court of Canada usually is a safe outfit to look to authority for. A couple of very important copyright cases, one from 1980, they said, and this gets quoted all the time, uh, it was from a lawyer, a young lawyer at the time who's now a judge, Copyright law is neither tort law nor property law and classification, but it's statutory law. It, uh, it's, it, it is what it says in the statute, no more, no less. It creates rights and obligations upon the terms in the circumstances set out in the statute. This was reiterated a few years later in a criminal case involving, directly involving copyright, R versus Stewart. Somebody broke into a union office at night and stole a couple of pieces of paper that had a list of names on it. Paper was worth, you know, a fraction of a penny or whatever, whatever blank paper is worth. And they said, oh, yeah, but they stole information. And the Supreme Court said, um, excuse me, no, um, what they stole is not property in the sense of giving rise to an offense under the criminal code. I may have break and enter may have been illegal and, and stuff like that. But in terms of theft, there was no theft and there was no copyright infringement. Um, so this is a direction our, our courts are going in more and more now, is, uh, is, is, is going against the notion of property uh, in intellectual property, and just construing the statute the way they find it. Everybody gets mad at the courts when they get creative. The courts are, 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 are getting quite literal when it comes to intellectual property now, and that's probably a very good thing. Um, so let's, let, let's go digress and go backwards in time a little bit, early history. So perhaps Western art started something like this, a caveman beating up another caveman for copying his bison drawing. Um, <laughs> the first sort of known case, um, um, and it was quite a celebrated one, was in the 6th century AD in, uh, in Ireland, where one monk got mad at another one for copying his book, and I understand it led to a battle. Uh, and the famous saying, to each cow its calf, to each book its copy. Then the Statute of Anne, which I mentioned earlier, which of course was a belated response, things moved slower in those days, to Gutenberg's printing press, which had come out in the, I believe, in the, around 1450, 1460. It took them a while, but, uh, <laughs> but they responded to this new, new high technology. Uh, and we move forward to modern times, and uh, there was already some tension about some of this quite a while ago from people like Charlie Chaplin and uh, some important litigation involving high technology. Any of you have ever been near a player piano? I, I, when I was little, we actually had one in the house or, or the remnants of one. The most amazing devices, these were a computer by any definition, really, uh, except they were you know, invented in the, in the 19th century and lasted for quite a while, uh, in spite of the efforts of the music industry to destroy them and make them illegal. Um, and uh, we've seen this again and again and again. Um, the, um, the movie industry tried to make the VCR illegal in 1984. Fortunately, they failed. 
fortunately for themselves, they failed because the VCR went on and, and video cassettes, and then of course later DVDs and Blu-rays went on to save Hollywood. So they were saved from their own stupidity, not the first or the last time. Uh, British Leyland tried to impose copyright on tailpipes. Uh, their, their cars at the time, at the time were notoriously rusty and poorly constructed, but so you had to get a new tailpipe every year or two, and they wanted a piece of the action, no competition. The House of Lords says no, can't do that. There's no copyright in the tailpipe. It's just a tailpipe, not a work of art. Um, somebody tried to get copyright in the listing from A to Z, as they would say in the United States, in a telephone book, and the Supreme Court said no, there's no creativity there. Um, somebody tried to stop the importation of perfectly, law, perfectly legal shampoo made in the United States that was shipped in abroad and brought back. The Supreme Court said no, that's a perfectly legitimate transaction, there's no piracy. Um, uh, in Canada, we had a series of cases starting in 2002 with this important case where this late artist, uh, Tiberge, uh, was upset because people were, were buying uh, posters of his paintings, legitimate posters, and there's a process in which you could lift the ink off, or a, a specialized shop could do this, you could have the ink removed and then redeposited in some manner, I don't know how, on, on a canvas, so it came up looking like a painting. There was no additional reproduction, it was just a change from one format to another. He didn't like this, but the Supreme Court said it was okay. Interestingly enough, it split 6-3 uh, for the English and the French judges. Um, now, the Supreme Court has since come out with a series of series of extremely important cases in terms of copyright. The, 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 we just talked about Tiberge, and they talked, said about overcompensating is just as bad as undercompensating. Um, but they've come out with a series of extremely important cases having to do with what we call fair dealing rights. Your right to engage in research, private study, and, uh, and uh, the word education has now been added to the Copyright Act, which we'll get to in a second. But in 2004, the Supreme Court said that, that lawyers um, who engage in research, obviously we like to make money in our work, and our clients like us to make money for them. Lawyers who engage in research can copy whole articles um, and do basically copy what's necessary to get the job done uh, in order to serve the profit-making motives of the law firm and their clients. Um, and uh, um, that research uh, had to be given a, quote, large and liberal uh, interpretation. And, uh, and not a restrictive meaning. Well, the, and, and then there was a case in 2007, which I was very much involved with, which involved what's called parallel importation of perfectly legitimate chocolate bars that were bought uh, somehow mysteriously at uh, low prices abroad, not through the official distributor, and brought back into Canada. It's all about free trade. And the, copy, the craft people tried to stop it because of the copyright in um, in this little logo here. And they, they thought they should be able to stop that from coming back into the country. Well, the Supreme Court said no. Um, a complicated decision, but basically the Supreme Court ruled in favor of free trade. Um, and some interesting comments from Justice Bastarash about legitimate economic interests and Justice Fish about how you shouldn't use copyright as an instrument of trade control. Um, again, this is all about property freedom to sell and buy and alienate and, and whatever. Um, freedom of expression uh, has become an issue. Um, it's been fixed in Canada, which I'll get to in a second, but uh, it wasn't always so. Uh, infamous case back in the 90s where the, uh, where the uh, CAW um, uh, squashed uh, the union, um, fittingly, uh, given the, the subject matter using copyright, uh, and he said, hey, we're just doing a parody of Bib the Michelin Man, and, you, and, 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 and Michelin said, no, 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 you're copying Bib the Michelin Man, and the court went along with this, which is kind of contrary to what was going on in the United States, another case that I'll get to, but this is coming back now. You may have read about this, uh, this young woman, that's her, her kid, down in southern Ontario, Esther Reitman, she, um, and the libertarians, I'm surprised, aren't going to this in a bigger way. I'm sure they will be in due course. Uh, this woman lives out in, you know, out in the boonies in southern Ontario. And she doesn't like the idea of Nextera, which is a huge multi-billion dollar corporation that's, 
that's kind of in bed with the Ontario government and putting up wind, windmills all over the place in people's backyards uh, with zoning approval and whatever. She doesn't like these. They're noisy and they kill birds and uh, they, they have all kinds of problems that we've heard about. So she's campaigning against them. Part of her campaign was she had a website and she made fun of their name, which is Nextera, and she called them Nextera. Well, they got a great big law firm to, 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 to launch a lawsuit against her for trademark and copyright infringement, for God's sake. And, and, and Ezra Levant, who rarely makes sense, made beautiful sense uh, of this, and, 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 uh, and really did some very good work on it. And, uh, you know, the, and the Ontario government made, is passing a statute called anti-slap legislation, which may, which may help her out. Uh, she'll win anyway, but the fact is that uh, if she has any kind of a half-decent lawyer, she'll win this thing, but the fact of the matter is they're trying to use intellectual property law to stifle her freedoms. Her freedom is to have freedom of expression, and hopefully if she's successful from her standpoint, not to have one of these bloody things in her backyard and next door to a child's school. Uh, in the United States, there was a case involving, uh, you, you may remember the, the song Pretty Woman from that lovely movie, Julia Roberts. Well, two live crew came along and um, did a parody of that. Um, the words are fairly raunchy, so shield your eyes. Um, you probably all know the tune. And it went to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court of the United States says, oh, that's fine, it's parody, you know, we have a sense of humor, and uh, you can do that without infringing copyright. We can now do that in Canada because we were able to get the word parody and satire inserted in the Copyright Act amendments that came into effect last year. But we have other freedoms that are being inter interfered with. Uh, some of you who may have had Kindles a few years ago woke up in the morning and found out that your copy of, of Animal Farm in 1984 had somehow got flushed down the memory hole <laughs> by Amazon who said, oh, we, we don't have the rights to this, so we're pulling it back in the middle of the night. Now, if that isn't scary, I don't know what it is. Um, never mind the NSA. and, and and we've had a lot of trouble in Canada with what many of us call, although I've not yet been able to convince the courts, what many of us call a tax on blank media. I mean, I don't know when the last time any of you ever bought a blank CDR. We buy them in the office for court cases, but nobody buys them for music anymore. There's a 29 cent tax on them. I tried to get the court to agree that it was a tax. They didn't. But I did have some success, and others as well were involved, in, in stopping an iPod tax and an iPhone tax and whatever that would generate a small amount of money for the members of a certain collective, uh, which seems to be on its way out now because the only thing they have left is this tax on, on levy on, on blank CDs. But I was very happy to see um, Minister Moore, who I suspect uh, wouldn't mind being called a libertarian, um, come out with this kind of not quite normal parliamentary language in Parliament um, saying that the idea of a levy on iPods and, and Blackberries and that sort of thing, which which they want, to, which they ask 75 bucks for, they say, oh, we didn't ask, but that's in the Canada Gazette. They want 75 dollars per unit. He said, this is really toxic and frankly really dumb. I mean, that was music to my ears to hear a minister speaking so frankly and so accurately, and it got nowhere. Um, uh, in fact, they enacted a regulation last year to make sure that even the copyright court couldn't push it. But, you know, we have a, a what can be called a tax of, of a, it's slightly lower than 516 now, on every public school student in the country for all of the illegal photocopying that they supposedly do. Yeah. And the, uh, the same collective, Access Copyright, is trying to get $45 per student uh, in universities for, for all of the copying that's going on. And where does this money go? Well, most of it goes to lawyers. I mean, the, 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 well, about 30, more than 30 percent of it goes to overhead. The rest gets distributed a few hundred dollars at a time to various members. I happen to be a member. Uh, there's my conflict of interest, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably their worst enemy, or one of their worst enemies. It's a very inefficient collective, and all it does, what it really, quite apart from the money, which is not trivial, it puts a hell of a chill on what goes on in the classroom. Professors are afraid to copy things, students are afraid to copy things, librarians are terrified of doing their job, which is to enable access. I hear about this every day. Um, the, the Canadian universities are getting dumbed down because of all of this copyright chill, 
and misinformation that they're getting from access copyright and sadly from their own organization which is the Association of Universities and Colleges and we'll get back to that if we have time. Um, copyright as a tax is not a new idea. I didn't invent it. The Libertarians didn't invent it. Lord Macaulay was, was on a rant about it in the House of Lords back in 1841. It's worth reading and looking that up that book. Um, so we've had some good news in Canada. We had, uh, last year we had uh, Bill C-11 come into law, which included the words education, parody, and satire in the fair dealing section of the Act, which is wonderful news. And it means you can more or less ignore all of the silly little library exceptions and whatever that come afterwards, except in the two or three instances where they're actually slightly more helpful. Uh, the timing here is very interesting. The law got royal assent June 29th. Supreme Court ruled July 12th, and uh, the CRTC signal, the value signal case that I mentioned came in December. It was a wonderful year for copyright in Canada, but you know, uh, these collectives and record companies and movie companies don't go gently into the night. They're trying to fight back and they're doing that on the trade front, which we'll come to. So the good news is that the copyright board, the Supreme Court has its sights set on the copyright board uh, and is fighting back against layered and inefficient and and stacked tariffs, as they've been called, um, and, and some of the more silly lawsuits that have been brought, or unbelievable ones like the movie industry and the record industry trying to convince the copyright board, even the copyright board didn't fight on this, and convince the Supreme Court that the word exclude actually means include. Go figure. Um, so the government, I, very happy and proud of them, actually introduced a, 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 a regulation, as they're entitled to do under the law, to prescribe the notion, to, to prescribe micro SDs, which are in yourself, your smartphones and your cameras, uh, out of the possibility of having a, a tax on them. That's not, the, the Copyright Board has very reluctantly agreed not to proceed with that hearing. There may be a judicial review or whatever of that decision, I hope not, but who knows, because the collective now has its back against the wall. So other good news in the United States, in the well-known Merck Exchange uh, case, that was Justice Thomas again, the silent Justice Thomas, but he writes well, uh, refused to automatically impose an injunction in a patent case, which was huge news to people, and that would normally follow from normal presets of property law, that you get a, in a patent case, you get an injunction. Well, he said, not so fast. Uh, injunction is an equitable matter, it's a discretion of the court, and you know, for years, people have been saying, look, if you import a $100,000 Mercedes or a Toyota, and it's got a $2 infringing chip or wire or something under the hood, should you, there be an injunction against you importing it or driving it? Well, obviously not. You just pay the royalty, or somebody pays the royalty. The courts have finally tweaked to that. Kurt Sang was a case where a kid from Malaysia uh, was going to school in the United States, and he figured out he could buy the textbooks that were required for some of his and his friends' courses back home in Malaysia for a fraction of the cost that they were being sold in the United States. Same books, perfectly legitimate books, but they were being sold uh, in a lower cost market and perhaps lower quality paper, but who cares. He brought them into, brought them back, not pirate, not, not counterfeit, and he sold them at a lower price. And uh, they, of course, dragged him off to the Supreme Court. Everybody jumped in and intervened, kind of like our craft case, and the kid won. And for those who care about ownership of your own body, um, as all libertarians seem to, can't imagine why. The Supreme Court of the United States just re recently ruled that a big uh, biotech company cannot claim ownership in naturally, naturally occurring uh, um, genetic sequences. They artificially create them, and I don't ask you the difference, because I, as I said, I'm a former musician. Um, um, they can't claim ownership, so that's a, a, a good barrier against claims of ownership in your body when, to the extent it gets genetically improved or even as it currently exists. Um, uh, so maybe we're in uh, for some creative destruction times. I was talking to a gentleman in the audience and the record business was not happy with the way things are going and the record industry and the newspaper industry and the publishing industry and everybody wants to use copyright law as a sort of panacea or a bailout for all of the ills of the world. Um, it's not going to work. It, it's just something, I mean, even if it could work, it won't work. Well, if it's not silly. But it, it, it can't work. You cannot shut down the internet. 
you know, the horse and buggy people could not stop cars, and, you know, stop Henry Ford. Some things are, are just inevitable, and we just have to learn to live with it. Um, so where are we going now? But, you know, we, we, society can err. Hopefully we err for the better, not for the worse, but uh, and most errors are eventually curable, except new rights and charter entrenchment not so easily. When something gets entrenched in the charter, by definition, it's entrenched. Um, we talked about Lochner this morning, why the Canadian skepticism of, of, uh, of including property, and if we do include property, we should be very skeptical of including intellectual property, because as I tried to point out, it's not even clear that it is property. Um, so these are the U.S. amendments that you all know, I'm sure. Um, so I should talk a little bit about politics, because I think there's some people in, at this conference who care about politics a little bit. And uh, IP is getting political, there's no doubt about it. Um, everything's getting political, even IP. It didn't used to be that way. Those, some of you may remember Sam Bolt, a liberal. Uh, she wanted to become Minister of Communications. Had the Liberals been re-elected that year, she might have been, but she lost her seat. She lost her seat because some people, some of us, found out that she was uh, uh, getting very close to the record industry, uh, who threw a uh, fantastic party for her, and, uh, and, and were, they, they, they were very tight together. And she got caught out on that, and uh, in behaving in a kind of very American way. And uh, she lost her seat in Parkdale, a very safe seat, but she got kicked out. So the Liberals didn't come back, but uh, even if they had, she, was, she wasn't there. She wouldn't have been there. Um, now, American politics, um, for a long time, people have observed that the Democratic Party um, is, um, how should we put it, kind of in bed with Hollywood. Um, and uh, why? Well, picture tells a thousand words. If Kennedy were around, you might ask him about, about <laughs> being in bed with Hollywood. Uh, if you haven't ever watched this on the internet, you should. This is Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday to President Kennedy uh, shortly before they both died. It's, it's very sad. It's very interesting as well. Um, so, uh, it, one of the fascinating things about libertarianism is that um, it kind of, and, and I thought that's why Stockwell with Dave's talk is so interesting, is that it, it kind of, it, it, it kind of transcends partisanism, and you know, it doesn't follow. You know, there are some libertarian liberals and some libertarian conservatives, and and, and some that are not either purely liberal or conservative. And, Maybe interesting to see where he goes with this, um, and it's the same in the IP discussion. I mean, there are some people who really love copyright but uh, are skeptical about it, and some that really hate copyright but but are good at enforcing it. Um, this leads to the story of current story of a young fellow by the name of Derek Kana, a good-looking young man from Washington who worked for the Republican Study Committee up until he uh, last December. He they published a policy paper. They publish all of these sort of think piece policy papers that hardly anybody would ever read, let, much less amount to anything. So he published one um, um, that said some vaguely libertarian things and just questioned whether you know too much copyright is a bad thing and perfectly safe stuff like that. It was a little bit naive. The kid just graduated from law school and it wasn't all that rigorous and it was just a think piece. But Hollywood got onto it and they, they went nuts. And over the weekend, they bombarded everybody in Washington with emails and letters and God knows what. He was fired right away, and this thing was retracted. The Republicans actually retracted this. Well, it's the best thing that ever happened to Canna's career because now, he, you know, now everybody knows who he is. He's writing for the Atlantic Monthly, and I'm not sure he's got himself a solid job yet, but I have no doubt that he will. He's a very good communicator. Um, so, what would happen if, Target, if, if IP were included in Charter now? Well, I think there's great danger that we would lose some of the fair dealing users' rights that the Supreme Court has given us. Don't forget, copyright's not only about owners' rights, but our Supreme Court has clearly told us it's about users' rights. Quote, oh, users' rights. That's their phrase, not mine. The difference, of course, is that owners can sue infringers for infringement, but users can't sue owners for wrongful denial of use of copyright. It's not quite symmetrical, but the Supreme Court has done a lot to restore that balance. Um, if IP were entrenched, we would lose some very, very important uh, means of, of societal regulation. For example, advertising. We talked about this morning about 
you know, zoning and, and, and growth laws and whatever, well, some people think that those have a place. Some people think that it's important to be able to restrict the ability of tobacco companies or gun companies, for example, to advertise. Um, you may remember this very sad case last year, where this cute little five-year-old boy shot his cute little two-year-old sister to death with, 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 with a gun, a real gun, that was marketed to five-year-olds by this company called Cricket. My first rifle, this is the American way of educating your children. Get them a gun when they're five. Let them blow their sister's head off. Um, these people have a trademark registration in the United States for my first rifle. And um, if they have property rights in that, then, then woe betide any government that tries to take that away. And that's what property owners are, uh, IP owners are trying to do. Uh, I, for a long time, and I had some involvement in the early days, there have been enormous legal campaigns and lobbying campaigns going on to protect the sacred right of tobacco companies to advertise cigarettes to children and anybody else who will read the ads and make it look like, you know, if you smoke cigarette, you can be happy out in the Rockies <coughs> riding around on your horse. And there was a big case, the most recent big case was in Australia, where Australia has uh, taken over, kind of from Canada, taken over the lead in plain packaging, which, which says, you can put the word, Mar word Marlboro on your package, but you can't put this kind of a picture on it. You've just got to put the word Marlboro so people know it's a, it's a Marlboro cigarette and not a Camel cigarette. But the word you can't use fancy fonts, it's got to be plain. Well, they fought that to the Supreme Top Court in Australia and won and lost. But not to be deterred, they're going to the WTO. Now what about freedom of expression, right? But what about, and we had a case in Canada on that that said that RJR has freedom of expression but there's still, you have to balance that with society's right to regulate. We don't, I, I don't think anybody in this room wants the cigarette companies to be able to put up billboards in schoolyards. Do you? I hope not. Um, there's some modules there. Really. Anyway, um, some other dilemmas as we speak. Um, should it be possible to contract out of your fair dealing rights? Uh, especially, they're very important in the university, whether they sign these licenses with these great big huge multi-billion dollar companies. Should the university be, well, even a big university has very little bargaining power dealing with Reed Elsevier or whatever. Um, should you be able to sign away your rights to fair dealing uh, and not be able to use your ability to crack digital locks if education is at stake? Why is the Association of Universities and Colleges in Canada gratuitously conceding these points to the uh, big copyright collectives? So the copyright industries will take a windfall wherever they can get it. They tried with the mouse in the house. They're trying now something called the three-step test, which is, a, which is, as you'll see, something of a red herring that they're trying to inject into domestic copyright law. And uh, they're trying in a bill, which I'm uh, looking at with others, uh, anti-counterfeiting bill that would enable border seizures or uh, searches of your computer and all kinds of other things. This three-step test is a red herring whenever you hear the term, your antenna should perk up. Um, politics in Canada, uh, again, I'm not partisan, but I have to say the Conservatives did a heck of a better job on copyright infringe infringement than the Liberals because the Liberals are very tight with the entertainment industry. Uh, as is the NDP, which may be more of a function of particular personalities that are there. Uh, Charlie uh, uh, was a professional musician, a very successful one. And the PQ just does whatever plays well with the artistic community in Quebec. But the Conservatives, frankly, I think because of a, they're, they're, they're the closest thing to libertarians we have in Canada at the moment, um, um, have, have, have come, finally come around and, and restored some common sense. But watch out in the trade negotiations because this conservative government is under a lot of pressure from the American government and uh, ideologies aside, uh, they may have to yield to that pressure so some of the gains may get lost in those trade negotiations. Uh, C-56 is very dangerous. I would give it a C- minus compared to C-11A plus or A. It'll criminalize ordinary behavior. It'll cost taxpayers dearly. It'll severely invade piracy. It'll put It'll, it'll put intellectual property infringement up there with treason and a whole bunch of other real serious criminal code offenses that will allow unauthorized, well, authorized, but I mean, warrantless 
um, uh, interceptions of, uh, of your email and uh, your computer and all kinds of things. So whatever privacy you have now, which is virtually none, would be even less. Um, so uh, when it comes to entrenching, uh, basically be careful what you wish for. We'll lose a lot of users' rights. We'll lose uh, a lot of innovation. We'll lose a lot of freedom of expression. We'll lose we'll lose possibility of cultural uh, development, standing on on uh, the shoulder of giants. We'll, we'll have an entrenched culture that will be dictated by Walt Disney and people, companies like that. And one of the wide, best law professors I ever had, he's now gone back to Australia, by the name of Harry Beck Glaspie. Uh, he um, used to tell us that you know, whenever you see a new law that you think maybe is wonderful, and you see a new case from the Supreme Court, look at it carefully and think of the worst possible unintended consequence that could befall from that event. And go to sleep that night knowing for sure that that will happen, <laughs> and sooner rather than later. So we're seeing it now sooner rather than later. It was in today's papers. I had done this slide before, but it, 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 it was like, like the, uh, the, the uh, Ikea monkey kind of fell into my lap. The next uh, chapter in Chapter 11, challenged by Eli Lilly against the government of Canada, is now taking place. They want $500 million um, uh, from the Canadian government because they, because get this, they don't like the way our courts are interpreting the patent law. Now it's one thing that the, the Chapter 11 investor state challenge was always an asymmetrical thing that, that you know, an investor could challenge the government in the other country for passing laws that are inconsistent with NAFTA. And that was controversial enough, and particularly because, in case anybody hadn't noticed, the United States is about 15 times larger than we are. I guess we didn't notice that at the time, so it was kind of asymmetrical. Uh, but it's now being used in intellectual property, and, and they have, I don't know, I guess the only word I can think of it, the chutzpah to use it against our courts and say, we don't like, they don't like the way our courts are interpreting pat patent law. The Supreme Court refused to take this case. This case has been up and down and sideways in the courts. The courts have given it fantastic, careful consideration um, uh, by some very, very good judges. And so they're not content with uh, what, what our Supreme Court says. They want to bring a NAFTA challenge in front of, 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 of three arbitrators. And this, if this isn't a loss, this is worse in a way, than, con than charter entrenchment. Because we theoretically, it's not entrenched, we can tear up NAFTA, but, you know, we'll be tied any prime minister who does that, or maybe 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 they'll get lots of votes, who knows, but not we're not there yet. Um, it's a very, very serious incursion on national sovereignty and, 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 and a big threat. Um, last but not least, running out of time, is what uh, I call the collective madness movement in Canada. We have, as I said earlier, about six times more collective than the United States. We have, by far and away, the largest copyright board or anything similar in the world. Uh, about half a billion dollars worth of tariffs flow through this mechanism. Um, we can talk about the tragedy of the commons and the tragedy of the anti-commons, but the collective industry, the collective mechanism in Canada is arguably out of control. And uh, not only does it involve a lot of money, but money is only money. The worst thing is, as I say, is chill in the classroom. And why should our students be, frankly, uh, less endowed with research, with access to knowledge, than their, their counterparts in the United States or South Korea or India or Brazil or Russia or India or China? Because these are, we have to compete with it. It's a global world now. So, speaking of... Uh, Denial of access. I'm out of time. Ai <laughs> Weiwei is in, continues to be in big trouble. He was a brilliant architect of that. And I thank you for your attention. If there's still time, I'll take questions.